Rival coaches Warren Gatland and Eddie Jones are putting together the final pieces of their tactical master plans as kickoff draws closer to Wales versus England. But what can we really expect in the battle between the two great coaches, and where will this hugely anticipated showdown actually be won and lost? We asked Mark Ring, former Wales fly half and centre genius, to don his coaching hat and assess what is in store at the Principality Stadium. Ringo was always ahead of time, a huge fan's favourite and rugby maverick who as a 10 or 12 saw things on the field years before others followed suit A keen student on the game, and subsequently a coach in his own right. Having been in the English Premiership He keeps a close eye on how rugby patterns have changed worldwide Here is Ringo's fascinating and unmissable blueprint of how Wales v England will be decided Ringo, having studied them closely against Ireland and France, I have to say this is the most impressive England team I've seen for many years They're hugely organised in defence and defence, from tight forwards through to 15 It's no coincidence for me this has happened since John Mitchell came on board as defence coach That was a master move by Eddie Jones, because you can see bits of New Zealand, the team Mitchell used to coach, in England's own play these days Previously England would commit three to four bodies at the breakdown, but the mindset has changed under Mitchell Watch closely and you'll actually see England players running away from rucks and fill out space backfield instead Mitchell insists on bodies staying on their feet, and that defensive positioning makes them hard to break down They wait for an opposition mistake, or the right time to turn over, then they pounce Defence has been Wales' biggest strength down the years under Sean Edwards, but Mitchell is doing something similar with England I've never known a Red Rose team so collectively organised in this respect and Ireland and France had no answers to it Wales have to try to find one. If England don't commit bodies to the ruck, and there is no space outside Wales will be better served with a pick and go to drive forward Gain momentum that way. But they'll have to do it immediately, otherwise they're simply slowing down their own ball It will become something of a war of attrition, but Wales have to be patient with this tactic and wear England down before the opposite happens That's England without the ball. When they have it in hand, again it's reminiscent of New Zealand for me. They still don't commit bodies to the ruck, they're quicker at shifting the ball out. 1 2, bang bang. They're away. Recycle, and off they go again. I haven't seen an England team playing with this speed before, not even the World Cup winners, but I've detected something they do technically to create the fast pace. If you're running left to right and are tackled, the natural instinct is to take ball in and recycle to the right. That, of course, limits options but it's the way it is. Yet England have suddenly developed a knack of somehow turning their body around in the tackle and presenting the ball to Ben Youngs on other side too The graphics below demonstrate how Billy Ivunapola did this against Ireland. It means our defence will suddenly have to come across 
England get the ball away, there's always close support to the ball carrier, they get into the correct positions early, and then Youngs has the option of going left or right. If our defence on the right has been sucked across, England exploit the gaps they have left behind. So how do we stop this? Justin Tipuric and Josh Navidi need to be alert to it and probably have the game of their careers in terms of work rate. Somehow, they must try to get to these rucks before England have cleared out, slow down the ball, be massively aggressive. Their tackle technique will be key, as well as quickly learning from referee Jacob Paper what they can get away with and what they can't. England's control and placement of the ball means it's bang bang in their way. Bang bang, same again. If they keep getting across the game line like this, Wales are in real trouble. Ireland have a fabled back row and fielded CJ Stander and Peter O'Mahony against Wales, but they couldn't cope. Nor France. This constant good quality breakdown possession gives Youngs and Owen Farrell so many options at half back. It's no wonder England have already scored eight tried from two tough matches. Wales have to learn from that. Their only hope is for Tipuric and Navidi to get there on time, slow down ball, meet them on gain line. Get the tackle technique right, support and straight over the ball. Trouble is, as Ireland and France found to their cost, how do you get over the ball when England have already moved it away? Wales have just got to hang on in there, get into strong defensive positions time and time again. There can be no slacking, not even in the 70th minute onwards, when bodies and minds become tired. They have to keep at it, maintain optimum concentration. This incredibly fast breakdown work is a challenge they haven't faced from England before. Ringo, there is a feeling in the modern game that you can't score from set pieces because modern day defenses are too well organized, but I beg to differ. New Zealand do it, why can't we? This, I feel, it could be one of our most potent weapons if used correctly. It's fine going through the phases, but how often do we see Wales do that, find no space and invariably kick the ball straight to the opposition? Which means it is going to be run back at us. Imagine there's a scrum down the left. Ross Moriarty and Gareth Davies need to pick up and with Gareth Anscombe, be away. Be and Youngs is on the other side of the set hit piece so out of the game, Billy Ivunapola still has his head down in the scrum. Logic decrees we have numbers, but we must be bold enough to go for it at that point and create immediate width. New Zealand often do this, and then they play in what we call the 15 meters channel near the other touchline. That isolates England's midfield blitz, where four players are lying in wait by taking them out of the game because we've gone wide instead. Pick and go a couple of times down that 15 meters channel, reload, reload, Elliot Daly will have to come across to cover. Then, with him stuck at the bottom of a ruck, exploit the space with a little dink in behind. The other thing I've noticed is that every time England blitz, Jack Nowell comes flying up from his wing. 
Watch closely and you will see he's ahead of the tackler. Recycle the ball and stick it behind Nowell or run into the gap he has left. Those are other options for Wales. But it does mean playing with tempo and width, which we haven't always tended to do. Ringo, England, as I've said, adopt a quick tempo game at the rucks. But as soon as play does slow down, and this is where our back row are key, and they're a little static, Youngs and Farrell tend to kick. But they never do it until they are properly organized behind, with players ready to chase. Run at speed, close down space, make the kick accuracy good, Chessers in position ready. Youngs must have trigger calls for this, because he never just kicks on a whim. If he did, forwards would be at the bottom of a ruck, but they're not, they're part of the chase too. Whenever Ireland kicked the ball it was straight to England. Wales have done that too down the years. With England 2019, there's more method behind their kicking. We need to deal with that with what is known in the game as an escort policy, whereby the catcher is shielded. Paul O'Connell and Martin Johnson talked about this after the Ireland match, noticing how successful England had been in reclaiming Conor Murray and Johnny Sexton punts, but I've seen footage of Southern Hemisphere sides doing it for years. It's nothing new, there's nothing revolutionary about this, you know. It's just that not everyone had cottoned on quickly enough over here. New Zealand are masters of the tactic. What happens is three forwards run back, right in the line of the Chesser, and make sure he doesn't get in front. They're entitled to run that line, there is no blocking because they're racing back themselves. That enables the fullback to take a comfortable catch because no one can get there to contest in the air. It's the escort policy I talk of. Because they have complete trust in the tactic and know the ball will be taken cleanly, the rest of the forwards are busy taking up positions center field or even out wide. They're not watching the ball, they know the escort policy will ensure it's taken, they're waiting for the counter. Boom, boom they're away. Take it on a few rocks, then suddenly they're over the line. It's no coincidence New Zealand score from open play like this, they are set up to counter from defense in precisely this manner. Dan Bigger can kick an up and under and win the ball back against Scotland, but it won't happen against New Zealand because of the escort policy. Wales have to employ these tactics as well to counter the moments Young and Farrell do stick it in the air. Make sure they don't let the English Chessers overtake them, trust in the catcher, get ready to counter. But it means the forwards being on alert and making sure they are busting a gut to get back into the correct positions themselves. The work rate required to stop England is going to need to be phenomenal. Ringo, every member of the England backline, with Manu Talagi probably the lone exception, has proven adept at putting in clever little grubber kicks behind defenses from which they have scored tries. It has been a clear England tactic and one Wales will obviously be alert to dot but I have more confidence in us dealing with it than either Ireland or France managed. France had Johan Huget, who made his name as a wing, playing at fullback, and he went missing in action. 
England exploited the gaps to the full. Ireland had Robbie Henshaw, a centre, playing at 15, with young Jacob Stockdale and Keith Thurles, another who made his name in the middle, offering cover. In Liam Williams Wales, have a proper fullback doing a fullback's job. Itchies the Lions 15, knows the right positions to be in at the right time. And if Williams has problems or is dragged away, he has the vast experience of George North to help out. I don't see England getting the same joy against us from this part of their game plan. Ringo, much of England's game centers around Billy Vunicola and Manu Talagi crashing over the game line and causing chaos in defenses. We saw it with Ireland and France and Wales have to devise a game plan to stop it. Look, if Vunicola is running at you at full pelt, he's very hard to halt. He has depth his tail up and momentum, while you're standing there waiting to make the tackle. It's an unfair contest and more often than not he'll just bosh you out of the way. The key for Wales will be twofold. Dago any, they have to close down the space quicker with aggressive defence, so Vunipola and Talagi can't build up ahead of steam in the first place. Two, they have to tackle lower. Get down around the knees, grip Bunapola's legs together as quickly as they can. Vunapola in full flight is some sight, and you won't stop him by going around the upper body, but the bigger guys also fall quicker if you get the tackle technique right. That gives Tapurika and Avidi a great chance to turn the ball over. Look, my methods will take their toll. You're exposing your shoulder to rock hard knees, it can hurt, you have to be prepared to go through the pain. But this is Wales v England. WHO wants it most. Ringo, this is a huge double plus for Wales. Mako Runapola is the world's best loose head, brilliant in the loose and pretty formidable at the scrum. He's another devastating ball carrier in open play, so his absence is definitely Wales' gain. Even more so, Meroidage. That bloke is an incredible rugby player. Courtney Laws and Joe Launchberry are excellent locks in their own right. But neither is Idage. I watched him closely for England against New Zealand and he kept coming over the top of the ball to win it back. He'd be hovering near offside asking the ref can I do this? Or he'd suddenly put in a bone-crunching tackle. He's an absolute pest. Kieran Red, as captain, had had enough. He flew in like an exocet at the next ruck and took him out. It was one heck of a hit, but New Zealand had had enough and Red, as skipper, took responsibility himself to target Idage. There can be no greater compliment to the England lock than the he was getting under New Zealand's skin. He's that good, was causing them any manner of problems, and they had to deal with him. Afterwards we didn't see Itage win many lineouts or be as influential at the breakdown. New Zealand did a job on him, legally. Again, his loss to England is very much Wales' gain. 
so let's look at this and Mako's absence as a positive. And if on Saturday an England player is dominating up front, making a nuisance of himself, which Wales player will be prepared to take read like responsibility and deal with it, legally, for the sake of the team? Ringo. He's just a phenomenal rugby player, our best forward, but would even be comfortable playing in the centre at test level. That's how good his hands in defence are. His decision making in close contact is exceptional, his positional play of the highest quality. And he's such an unassuming guy, too. It is just a shame we can't team him for this one with Tolupe Faladao and Ellis Jenkins. No disrespect to the others, but they are the three we really need. What a balanced back row that would be for the World Cup. Ringo, he's in fantastic form. Holds his own in the scrums. His line out work is top drawer. He's got a good skill set, is a super leader. He's one of our world class acts for me. Ringo, he's shown on the Lions tour, and I'm far more comfortable seeing him at 15 rather than on the wing. He's our standout strike runner, the biggest threat to England. George North, Jonathan Davies, and Josh Adams may get on the end of things to score the tries, but he's our most creative back. Perhaps by some distance. Defensively, he's also sound. Competitive over the ball, physical in contact. As last line of defense he slams opponents down near our try line, stops them scoring when it seems odds on they will. He has everything in his locker. Ringo I'm delighted he's starting for the first time in the tournament. Not only is Davies Wales best nine, although Rees Webb begs to differ he's the best scrum half in the championship for me. Davies has a competitive edge, is a real winner, possesses a great rugby mind, links backs and forwards, has good decision making and scores tries. I like the edge that he's got. Also, he has a good record against England. Remember that World Cup try at Twickenham? Is he underestimated? Certainly not by me. Ask Stephen Jones at the Scarlets. I bet he'd lavish Davies with plots. England have been hugely impressive, and whatever happens on Saturday, they're still the most likely title winners, I'd suggest. I'm not sure Wales can necessarily beat Scotland away and Ireland at home in their remaining games. But given the passion, sense of occasion, Principality Stadium factor and their tag as underdogs, I do think they are more than capable of nicking this one at home against the old enemy if they get that game plan right. It's Wales v England. We've seen down the decades how anything can happen in Cardiff. Time and again, good England sides have come here and gone away with their tail between their legs. But if I'm honest, deep down, unfortunately, I'm struggling to see it this time. Sadly. I know, from playing myself at the old Lansdowne Road, just how hard it is to go to Dublin and win. Yet England looked comfortable there, and we've certainly got our hands full, put it that way. England strike me as confident, not the kind of side that has come here before. That said, quite a few of these players haven't sampled the unique atmosphere Wales v England can create. Let's wait and see how they cope with it. Many an England player has cracked under that pressure in the past. 